Hi, I'm Chris. Um, uh, I've worked at Google uh, for actually about nine years. That's the funny thing about this. It's really more like uh, this is sort of a story I've been telling lately uh, about the meaning of Android and, and where it came from. A lot of people, they, they, they have all these assumptions about uh, the origin of Android, but like the movie Wolverine Origins, it's not the truth. It's, it's not good. Uh, so I wanted to tell the actual story of how Android got started as part of the story of where we are now uh, in the mere 20 minutes, which I usually take just introducing myself. Um, yeah, so, so let's get started. So oh, this is like, oh, look who I am. Um, but you know, if you don't know, I'm sure you can use your favorite search engine, whichever one it might be, to find out. Although on one of them, there's a uh, scrapbooker who is more popular than me with the last name of Dubona. So that's uh, something I'm conflicted about. But um, yeah, hi. So I'm Chris. I look after license compliance for Google. That's my primary job. I do these speeches from time to time, but my main job is making sure Google does not screw up compliance. And actually, most of that work is done by Daniel Berlin, who's over here in the second row. Uh, so he's like the true hero that allows me to go and uh, do ridiculous trips, uh, like New Orleans, and have a beignet, in theory. Um, and we run Summer Code and a bunch of other programs. So you know, uh, the only thing I'm going to say about the Summer of Code during this is that if you have a college-age friend or, or child or girlfriend or something, whatever, uh, or boyfriend, tell them about the Summer of Code. It's a great way to get introduced to open source software development. On average, for the last five or six years, although we've been running them for nine years, uh, we've generated about uh, three million lines of code for open source projects via this program every single year. Uh, and it pays, so it's like a little internship where they do it wherever they are. And we have a high school flavor of this, too. So any of you who might have high school students in your lives, tell them about the Google code end so that they can become one of us in this world of open source software. And I just saw a person in a penguin suit walk by in the conference hall back there. That was a little freaky. Because um, it's like, it's like anyway, uh, so 2005. Late 2004, I was asked to take part in a study about uh, sort of how people get to their information and what they do with it when they get it uh, at, at Google. Where I was a Noogler at the time, I, I was brand new to the company. And we, we mapped out everything. We mapped out how mobile worked, how uh, codecs worked, how uh, people got to the internet via browsers and, and all the rest. Because we had this idea in our head um, that there was this platonic ideal going on on the internet where people could go basically to any website they wanted to go to uh, from any sort of platform they were on. And that was a, an ideal. And it was an ideal that gave birth to Google in this sort of very fair and yet very, very competitive environment. And how did that happen? How did the internet happen? And, and we all know the story of the internet and servers and all the rest. And, and, and if you look at uh, it now and if you look at it through the history, what was happening was you had multiple uh, open source options competing with actually multiple commercial offerings uh, to satisfy their end user or the developers who might use a tool like, say, Apache, which was competing against IIS and, and, uh, and other options, or, or SendMail competing with QMail, competing with Outlook, competing with you know, Lotus Notes, I guess, at the time, um, which I know you're all are huge fans of, so I don't want to forget about it. And that was a joke. It, <laughs> not because it was bad. It was very innovative for 1990. Too. Um, so, but let me continue. Uh, but if you looked at the way people were competing for users, it was when you had this platonic ideal of multiple open source projects competing with each other and commercial uh, options competing too, that ended up resulting in a great environment for us to exist in, for Google to exist in, right? Uh, and so we're like, okay, what, what does 2005 look like to the smartphone user? Right? And at the time, smartphone honestly meant Symbian and maybe a bit of RIM and a little bit of Windows uh, CE slash Windows Mobile at the time. Uh, at that time, Symbian was around 84, 87% of the market, and the rest was RIM and, and Windows Mobile. Uh, and, and you know, we had gotten wind about the iPhone and, and what people were thinking about that. And we knew it would be a very powerful you know, competitor in the space. But, and I know that none of you have seen an iPhone. It's made by a company called Apple. And um, that was also kind of a joke, just keeping you rolling here. Um, but, but we also knew that to get Google onto these phones at the time was pretty grim. You know, you had to use WAP, you had to use WHTML. And often, 
to get your website into these browsers, you would have to cut a deal with a carrier, a handset manufacturer, and, and it was bad, right? And, and basically, we knew you didn't have to be brilliant. And a lot of people are like, it's the year of mobile, man. And it's like, wow, welcome to 1994. Um, you, you know, you, you didn't have to be a genius to figure out this is where we were going. That, you know, you know what? Uh, people are going to be carrying around mobile phones and they're going to be accessing the internet on them. Who knew? Well, everyone knew this. This wasn't, you know, brain rocket surgery. Uh, so, so we wanted to make sure that they could have the same sort of experience they had on the desktop with multiple browsers competing to access multiple servers on the internet uh, on their phones. And we're, but there was no real open source option. Um, that we felt would engage the user. And there were a couple of open source projects out there trying to do it, but nothing that we were convinced would actually do well. So we came up with Android, and we're like, OK, uh, what, what would a good open source option in the mobile operating system space look like, right? Well, we knew it would have to be able to access the internet and get web pages just like a normal browser would. Um, it wouldn't have that kind of gatekeeping mechanism where it would only go to those uh, websites that were approved by the carrier. Um, and, uh, and, and we went a little further, because we, when we were thinking about licensing and, and why we picked the Apache license as the bulk of Android, we knew that it would have to have a good patent grant attached to it um, so that people would not be worried that Google would come and rent and seek against them uh, as they implemented their Android phones. Uh, and so, you know, we came up with Android. This was uh, the G1. That wasn't the one I gave away four years ago. I gave away the one right after this. Um, and you didn't get one. So thanks, Jim. That makes people love, love the person talking. Um, so <laughs> they're like, you could do it, really. No, no, no. Um, and, and so this is what we launched, you know. We wanted to basically provide, in some ways, a new minimum that people would expect from cell phones. That no one would ever again think, you know what we need to do? We need to make sure that website X pays us before we allow you to access them. Um, you know, we were anticipating problems with net neutrality even this early on the mobile uh, experience. So we basically wanted to make it really hard for people to compete uh, in a marketplace of restriction. And so now where are we, right? So we're in this place now where we have multiple open source uh, competitors. Uh, although most of them are Android forks, frankly, um, and multiple commercial operating systems all competing for user desire. And what that means is since the user really, really wants to get to their websites, they really want to get to applications too, um, that the cell phone operating system vendors can't basically compete by restriction. And we can't do it, uh, Apple can't do it, and the rest. We have to provide a minimum level of freedom. Uh, that allows companies like Google to continue to, to exist, and yours too. So where are we today? Uh, for Android devices, we pa passed the billion devices shipped mark. And those are just the ones that have activated with Google. That doesn't include the many, many, many millions of devices uh, from alternatives uh, like Amazon, solid alternatives like Amazon's Kindle line, uh, and others. Um, and it's more than a million plus devices activated every day. And those are all running Linux. And, and Jim's talked about it, but you know, the, the reality is that Android's success has been very good for Linux. I think it would be very, very hard, for instance, for the Raspberry Pi to be as successful as it had without the system-on-chip device support that Android brought. Um, so we work really, really hard to ensure that that continues. So for instance, just in the last month alone, we've released three different versions of Jelly Bean into the Android Open Source Project. We have KitKat on deck. Uh, I'm not going to say coming soon because I don't know the exact date uh, of the KitKat launch for the Android Open Source Project. But we keep on releasing software. And while uh, it's more of the punctuated equilibrium model, uh, it gets better every year. And four years ago, uh, when I talked with people, they were still accusing us of operating a fork and wake locks are from Satan and, and all of these things. Um, but we stuck to it and we kept working with the mainstream kernel community to make sure that all of our changes were frankly cohesive of what they were doing because we knew what shipping, at the time, hundreds of thousands of devices in a week <laughs> uh, would turn into. And we knew that if we could just keep as close to the main line as possible, it would be good for us and good for Linux. Uh, and that's where we are today, which is it's a pretty good place to be. So how do you know it's actually open source? 
And now this is a really important thing, because we see people talking about open platforms all the time, and it uh, it's personally bothers me. So let me, know, let me just give you a little bit of shorthand, so how you can tell something's really open source, something's really made from free software. Uh, is somebody other than the company who made it shipping it, right? In competition with that original shipment. So for instance, in Android, you have Android phones coming out of, actually, I, I was on the next slide. Oh, did I go forward like 12 slides? It's like, anyway. Uh, so you have phones right now from Android, well, not, not a phone, you have the tablets from Amazon, you've got phones from Facebook, you've got phones from Yandex, Baidu, and a bunch of other shippers. You have what I call fractional phones, which is when a Chinese manufacturing organization will say, you know what, we have an overnight shift, that, uh, and maybe they ship Windows Mobile in the day, and they're going to ship Android at night. I mean, you see these things all over the place. Uh, and oftentimes, uh, a number of these platforms, they never say word boo to Google. They ship their own app stores. There's many, many flourishing app stores out there. Uh, they ship their own everything. And so this is one way you know that Android is actually released under a real open source license. And you'll also notice that we're not out there suing them for doing it because we used a patent granting license that would preclude that. Uh, and it's also not in our nature, but the reality is if we're optimizing for even a, an evil Google, which doesn't exist currently, um, you would know it, right? So when somebody says that they're shipping something open source, you should ask yourself, how are they actually doing it? Um, it you know, we even went so far as you, you, the robot up there in the upper right-hand corner, I'm sure you all have seen this all over the place. Um, that was released under the Creative Commons by attribution license uh, at the, from the very, very beginning. And it's, it doesn't have a cute name like Andy or Larry or something like that. It's, uh, it's, it's just called the bug droid, because we weren't super creative about our naming. Um, and, but even that was released. So when I bought a phone case for my recent phone, uh, it actually came in a box. And the box actually had the licensing information for the bug droid, which I had never seen people comply with, frankly. It's very rare to see that, because they're like, Hey, I've got a dancing robot figure in my commercial, and there's no logo. You know, they're not going to say anything. And sometimes you can track it down. Um, but yeah, it's, it's funny because my job is license compliance. So sometimes I'll email a manufacturer and say, you know, it would be great if you put the, this bug droid licensed under the hello? Hello? Uh, <laughs> so yeah, uh, it, it's kind of interesting. But, but we did something a little different, too, in, in the creation of Android that a lot of people don't think about. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the Intense system in Android? Just raise your hand. Yeah, so about an eighth of you, maybe a 16th or a 24th. Or... Anyway, so what it does is basically when you have an application that's going to send an email, it tells the operating system, I'm going to send an email. And the operating system comes back and says, well, here's, here's how you're going to do it. Uh, and then you say, you know what? Uh, I'm going to install K9 mail on my phone. So you install K9 mail. The next time you go to send an email, the operating system is going to give you that screen. Which program do you want to run to send your email? And you can pick just once or uh, forever, whatever your choice is. Suppose you want to switch over to K9 from, say, Gmail. Uh, so you, you click that. That's the intent system in action. And if you add another email program or if you reset it, it'll ask you again. Um, you know, and, and it's not just for things like, like email or going to a browser, right? Oh, by the way, we're the only platform that allows you to swap out the browser, too, which is nice. Um, you, you know, you can do it with lock screens, you can do it with home screens, you can do it with the SMS application, the dialer, uh, contacts, anything, right? Uh, you can create your own intents. So suppose you have uh, some app like WhatsApp or whatever that has a new kind of intent that it also wants to do. Well, you can do that, right? Uh, and we did this because we also knew that one of the ways that people would express themselves is by not allowing you to replace competitive offerings, right? Like a browser, like uh, a map system. So in fact, a lot of people don't know this, but when you use Chrome on an iOS, you're really using a wrapped Safari rendering engine with some Chrome bits around it, because we are not allowed to ship our own browser on that platform. Same thing is true with Windows Surface and, and a bunch of other platforms. So we, we didn't want to be that company, right? And so we built that in from the very beginning in Android. Uh, so yeah. Um, Android's been ported in a bunch of places. You know, it's funny. Uh, with the drama that's gone on uh, with RIM, for instance, you know, we've seen them say, well, we're going to ship a phone that can run Android applications. And the way they did that is they took the Android open source project and they just put the frameworks on top of their operating system. And they've recently said they're thinking about shipping RIM on top of Android as a, you know, a home screen type replacement, I guess. Uh, I, I, I'm not privy to their plans because they don't talk to us. Why would they? They don't have to. 
Uh, similarly, you know, you've seen people take things like the old WebOS operating system and port it to run on top of Android. And if you look at a lot of, frankly, some of the very exciting work that's being done uh, with Firefox OS and Ubuntu Edge and the rest, you, know, you can usually find some Android there, whether it's at the driver layer or the Surface Flinger layer or, or it's something else. And, and that's pretty great, uh, honestly. And when I look at, like, so I, I finally got to handle a Firefox OS phone uh, when I was in Brussels recently. Not because it's the only place you can get it, it's just I ran into a guy. Um, and it was really pretty cool. And I was like, oh, you know, it, it, it's great to see your software get out there. Um, and, and Android has been created so that that works. Uh, and it's been ported to non-ARM platforms rather natively. So it runs natively on MIPS, uh, ARM, x86, and a bunch of other platforms. So, uh, and if you're creating a new platform, it's actually pretty easy to do. So uh, often, you know, usually the, the biggest trouble people have is getting video to work right and the, and the other sensors uh, because of the vagaries of that, those businesses. So, yeah. So, so that's where we are today. You know, we have a Play Store with over a million apps. Over 50 billion have been downloaded as of uh, July of this year. Um, and and you know, we're shipping the Moto X phone out of Motorola, but there's lots of great phones out there, the Galaxy S4 and all the rest. And they're all running open source software, either software that we've released as open source or, frankly, your code that we've brought into the operating system uh, in the form of the kernel and, and elsewhere. So, so that's sort of an update. And that's, that's five years. And I said nine years because we did that study back in in 2005. Um, but you know what it comes down to is that um, the Android today is actually a really powerful thing. And, and I want people to understand what that power is. And it's really been informed by really what Apache did and, and what SendMail and QMail and all the rest did. Uh, and, and because of that understanding and because of what open source brought to us, and because of, frankly, the head start that using an open source kernel and these open source tools brought with it, we were able to make Android work uh, for Google, but also for all these people who don't like Google. So, so it's a pretty great thing. Uh, and that's where we are today.